Hello, everybody. Welcome to the second last lecture for our course. Um, so again, for this week, we have two lectures, this one and then one more that will come later in the week. And then next week is our final week and it's presentation. So there will not be any lectures, but your task because of that is to complete your presentations, but also to engage in discussions with other students. And uh, I, I really want to congratulate or draw attention to the few of you, and it really is only a few of you, that are really attuned to the course, that are really engaged. I know it's difficult for everybody, but to see uh, your engagement, I am noticing it. I, I go through all the names off the top of my head. Brianna, I want to particularly thank you for your very engaged, pointed uh, discussions. It's very clear you're following along in every single lecture, and that's just so appreciated. You know, because on your end, um, it's hard to engage, I'm sure. Uh, uh, it comes with certain liberties, the disengagement as well. But on my end, it's also difficult because I'm just looking at myself here. <laughs> it's literally like narcissists looking into the pool of water. I just see my own reflection back at me. I don't see anybody out there. So this is all I get sort of for feedback to know if, you know, what's going on out there. And the silence can be really, really damaging um, for all of us. So, um, so that's what's happening for the next uh, roughly two weeks or less. Um, so this week we're talking about, I titled it Modern Gossip and Secrecy. It should really just be titled Gossip and Secrecy because we're not just talking about it in the modern period. You know, as I see it so far in this course and every course of mine is kind of a unique invention, although I sometimes draw from similar sources. There's a different reason for doing so in every course. And I never really know what it is until the end of the course, if I'm being honest with you. We always sort of retroactively create this invention. And what I've noticed that we've created together um, is, um, I, well, how, do, how shall I lay this out? I see things moving in a particular direction. First of all, let me share the screen. I see that we've been talking about, let's call it context um, or environment, you know, the, the context with, we've been talking about the context within which certain thinking has been happening, certain, certain intellectual traditions, certain orientations and so on. So we've had different contexts, right? R really just two, and we've really only focused on one uh, up until today. So what's interesting is that context is just another name for environment. It's a synonym, basically. It basically, for me, for our course, it basically means the same thing as environment, as ideology or ideology, however you pronounce it. Uh, I like the, the emphasis on ideology because it sounds close to idiot. <laughs> and we're all kind of idiots uh, in, in terms of our, uh, our sort of naive and tacit taken for granted presuppositions, which is what ideology is all about. Um, it massages us into accepting it. So be that as it may, we discussed the modern context. Right, so that's, that's sort of one context that we've been discussing. We opened the course with the modern context. Um, the modern context brought certain concerns to the fore within particular intellectual orientations. I'm not gonna repeat all of those concerns today. Um, I, I'm sure you can remember some of them. We talked about secularization, urbanization, the growth of crowds, the triumph of quantity and the critique of quantity over quality and so on and so on and so on. All I wanna add is that today we're going to look more at the let's call it the contemporary context. Uh, not the modern, therefore, but we could put it another way, the postmodern context. A word I'm sure we've all heard by now because it's entered popular culture. Uh, so the environment, that is the ideology, has shifted from a modern one to a postmodern one. There's been some changes since the time of, let's say, Nietzsche, Emma Goldman, and George Simmel. 
who are somewhere within the modern context on the threshold, perhaps of the postmodern. These are very close to one another. In fact, it's, sometimes it's quite hard to see what, what distinguishes a modern orientation or sensibility or environment from a postmodern or contemporary one, no doubt. But we're gonna try and plot that a bit more today. So we might say that we've been kind of operating across two axes. You know, when we talk about an axis, like in a Cartesian coordinate system, we can say there's like a, a Y axis or a vertical and a horizontal or an X axis like this, you know? So we've been kind of operating across these two axes. We've been engaging with them. The first has to do with the context. Um, that's, let's call it the horizontal axis, the X axis, and there's the modern and there's the postmodern, right? Um, the second has to do or had to do with the individual styles of thinkers. We would say this is the vertical axis. Okay, and there's there's individual styles of thinkers. So let's um, let's just erase this all for a moment. If we've been talking about context on the one hand, then we've also been talking about um, how could we put it uh, orientations or schools of media and culture, so however you want to put it, intellectual traditions. You know, there's many words to say the same thing and, and there's no reason why we should be dogmatic about which words we use. Um, so, so we're talking about the individual styles of, of groups of thinkers. Um, we've been engaged in sort of case studies you know, of particular influential thinkers within particular schools or orientations of thought. And these thinkers are operating within a context, which is why they're on a different axis. They're, they're within a particular context while they're doing their thinking. They're trying, to, they're trying to explore the confines, the parameters of their environments to understand those environments. Um, so they're, they're operating within a context, they're trying to understand something of that context within which they are thinking. So we, we basically, we outlined three schools here, I hope you remember. We could maybe think of a few others, but for our purposes, we've outlined three schools. We've called them variously, the Toronto School, the Slovenian School, and the... Um, British or Birmingham school or orientation. And of course, we've had our exemplary figures within each of these schools, McLuhan, Slavo Zizic, Stuart Hall, Raymond Williams, and so on. Um, okay, let us, for simplicity's sake, just consider this to be something like a vertical axis and the context to be something like the, the um, horizontal axis. Okay, so taken together then, we have a vertical and a horizontal uh, analysis, an analysis that goes, that, that moves us from one context to another and says, what are the different orientations or questions that are being asked within a particular context? And then a, a vertical tradition that says, okay, within that particular context, how can we particularly, how can we look at the particulars of, a, of an orientation? So, um, the vertical, therefore, the vertical axis, therefore, doesn't replace the horizontal axis. It merely situates it. It gives us more depth at a particular moment, historical moment or environmental uh, situation, uh, particular context. Uh, okay. So, as a concept, as a consequence, we could say, for example, what would a modern Toronto school or Toronto orientation be in contrast to a postmodern Toronto orientation? Or what would a modern Slovenian approach be when compared to a postmodern approach and, and so on and so on? But, okay, these are really interesting questions. I'm going to bracket them out, but this is what we could do um, because there are certain limitations to that approach as well. Uh, the Slovenian school, with Slavo Žižek as our example, for example, emerged precisely within the context of post-modernity. They were not necessarily thinking as an orientation within the modern period, right? And, and uh, so that's key. 
though, though it has a modern analysis, which it can distinguish from a postmodern analysis, it is situated within a postmodern frame environment. Uh, and hopefully before the end of the course, perhaps before the end of today, you'll see what I mean by that. So things are very subtle here and nuanced. It's, it, it's, not, it's not simple. It's not simply, we can't produce these very simple analytic categories uh, because, because things are, are just not that simple here. So the problem is though, we don't know yet entirely, although perhaps we have some inclination before we came to this course, and, and maybe you've studied this elsewhere, we don't fully know what we mean when we say postmodern. We get a sense of what questions are important in the modern context, but what about the postmodern context? We need to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, so that's a thread we're going to leave dangling for a moment and return after we've done some developing today and return to it before the end of today's class. Um, the way that I'm going to approach it is a little weird and I'm not sure why I chose it. I feel like it's important. I have an intuition that it's important. I have an intuition that it touches something of central importance today, partic particularly today uh, with a lot of the uh, controversial topics that circulate in the in the world today, having to do with uh, new social, the newest uh, social movements, having to do with uh, so-called cancel culture and woke and all this other stuff. Um, so I have a feeling it, it sort of touches that, but in a tangential way, without touching it directly. And I leave it to you to try and figure out how it might address those topics. But I think, I think it nonetheless is a nice gateway to discuss something like postmodernism. Nobody else is really talking about this as far as I can tell. The topic that I wanted to talk about is, of course, secrecy and gossip and rumors and um, yeah, okay. So let's go there. And they're not necessarily all the same thing. This is how I wanted to frame our discussion today as a way of entering into uh, understanding what postmodernism is to be distinguished from the modern context. Why? Well, because it's clear to me, uh, it's clear to me that the role of secrecy has changed since we've shifted out of a modern context into a postmodern context. The role, the function of secrecy, of secrets within a social group uh, has fundamentally, quite fundamentally changed. George Simmel, who we uh, discussed in the first class, we are returning to him again today to get a sense of how secrets function in the modern context, and then we'll see what changes in the postmodern. Uh, but Simmel's work on secrecy was, was perhaps best articulated in, I would say, two essays. First, it's an essay titled The Sociology of Secrecy and of Secret Societies. Uh, but I think we could also learn a lot about what's going on in that essay uh, by talking a bit about another essay he wrote titled Quantitative Aspects of the Group. So we're gonna kind of pull from both of these essays, more from the, this first one here. Uh, and this one we're going to use mostly to help us understand his claims in this other essay. But these are the two really important essays by George Simmel. You remember how to spell his name, right? Oh, this is hard to do. Simmel, George. I should have just typed it. Okay, okay um, so the sociology of secrecy and of secret societies, this essay was published in um, a journal, I think in 1906. So it's, it's more than a hundred years old. That's significant, right? What has changed in a hundred years? Well, we can say probably around the 19, 
late 1970s, early 1980s, we've shifted into a fundamentally new social bond, a new social structure, a new ideology, a new environment, new media were being developed, and so on. And we're going, again, we're going to talk more about that before the end of today, trust me. So um, remember that George Simmel was one of the sociologists in the German context who we used to introduce us to the modern context in our first class. So it's only fitting that we should return to him in the last part of our class. It wasn't, it wasn't planned that way. I mean, I know I have it in the syllabus, but I, I didn't really, I wasn't really thinking, but now it seems fitting. Um, Simo was quite interested in what he called the quantitative rather than qualitative, the quantitative aspects of a social bond or a social group. It's a very obscure title uh, for a fairly obscure essay, but a really fun essay. Simmel's essays are really fun to read. Uh, and I can't get into all of the details surrounding this particular text or any of other of, of Sybil's texts because uh, we, we only have so much time and we do have a purpose in, in making use of his work for this course. But I do want to break it down into its most elementary, its rudimentary um, uh, parts. What's most basic? His basic question in this essay, in the quantitative aspects of the group, is what happens when you move from a small scale society, a society made up of few members that are somewhat um, loosely connected to one another, not interacting a lot and so on, to a more complex, larger, more densely populated society? What happens in that transition? In other words, what happens when you have the birth of crowds, when you have more urbanization and so on? What happens when you move from smaller, loosely connected groups to larger, more densely interactive uh, populated groups? Uh, and he, he made it even more basic than this, you know? He said, basically, what happens Imagine then what happens when you move from a group of two or what's called a dyad to a group of three, let's say three or more, greater than three, which is called a triad or a triadic group. What happens in this movement? What happens to the social bond? It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question, and Simmel was really the first to look at it in this particular sociological way. Um, so what happens to the qualities or the characteristics of a social group when it increases in complexity and size, basically? You should notice how, once again, it's a very modern question. It's a question posed in the modern context. Imagine it like this. You have a group of, here comes my terrible drawings. You have a group of two people. Uh, here they are. Okay, you have a group of two people and this is your social group. And I'm gonna indicate that it's a social group by drawing a circle around it, which means it's a bounded social group. We can clearly see its contours, its perimeter, okay? There, anything outside of this social group is not part of this social group. We could even give it a name if you like, why not? Let's call it a marriage. Okay, so this is a married couple. Um, doesn't matter their gender, anything else. The point is simply that we have two people that are um, in this case, tightly bound into a marriage. And that's their social group. Their social group is that they are married. Okay, this is a dyadic social bond. Uh, what type, what, what can we say about this type of social bond? I, again, I'm gonna reduce it to its simplest elements and I'm not gonna tell you everything from his essay, just what's important for us. What's important for us is that we can say this is actually um, a fragile social bond. Soren, do you need your microphone? Oh, okay. So let's give it some characteristics. It's fragile. It's a fragile social bond. You're probably saying, why is it a fragile social bond? Because it can break very easily. That's why it's a fragile social bond. Let's, 
let's consider the fact that if this person says, I'm fed up with this and walks away, there's no more social bond here. There's just one person. One person leaves and the whole social bond, the marriage is over. It's all it takes. That's how fragile the social bond is. Um, it, it, it's, it, it, it's, it's always uh, volatile in this way. This would be another characteristic. These are my words rather than symbols, but uh, I think it basically means the same thing. Volatile. It's volatile because and fragile because there's no distance between these two people, basically. They see each other every day. They know all of their secrets. You know, I mean, there's basically no secrets here. First off, that's, that's, a, that's one of the important components of a dyadic social bond is that you, you're so close, in fact, that there can be no secrets. You know their bathroom habits, you know, you know their private eccentricities, you know their perversions and um, you know their inner monstrosities and they know yours, right? That's why it's volatile. There's really no distance between the partners. They're basically together without interruption, without intervention. Um, there's nothing fully separating them. Now we can complicate complicate this very easily and say, well, the division of labor, when perhaps one of them or two of them go out to work, that's a form of separation. But we're just going to keep this very simple at a, uh, for, for our purposes now. It's a very dangerous position, a marriage like this, because it increases the emotional volatility of the group. We would expect to know basically everything about one another. Not, not that we expect to, it's presumed that you do. You share all sorts of details about your life, uh, and indeed you must. This is not my lover. This is not my wife or my husband or my partner. This is also my best friend. It's my everything. <laughs> you know, this sort of, we hear this a lot. So basically what I'm getting at is there's no secrecy here or very few secrets. So let's, let's just, uh, I don't know, I'm going to put it like algebra, minus secrecy, which means there's, not, there's very few secrets. And secrets here are actually a threat. The idea of a secret is um, in, a, in a dyadic, fragile social bond, such as a marriage, perhaps. Marriage is really just our example. But, um, the idea of a secret is a very dangerous and threatening thing. We're afraid of secrets in this fragile, dyadic bond. We don't want them. We want to, we almost expect to know everything. You know, if, if there's a secret, even if it's innocent, we could perceive it as a threat and it could destroy us. We could say, it's not the fact that you did that. It's the fact that you wouldn't tell me that. I'm not upset at what you didn't tell me, the content of what you, I'm upset that you kept the secret from me as if there's a trust that we're not supposed to keep secrets or something like that, right? So secrets are very damaging to the social bond. There's other properties here, but we're going to keep it simple and stick with this. Now imagine for a moment, something happens to this family. What happens? Oh, geez. what's going to happen to this family? Let's think. Well, maybe a child is born. Okay. So now we have a triadic social bond. Ah, forgive me. I need to change colors to be consistent. Okay, so we have one, two, three, three people. And now we delimit this. We draw the parameter. We say this is a social group and we call it, what do you wanna call it? Uh, let's call it family. It's a social group called a nuclear modern family. The nuclear family was of course considered the the ideal typical family structure in the modern period. Of course, in the postmodern period, it, we pretty much all presume that this is not what's considered the normal family anymore. We talk about liquid families and so on. So, but in the modern period, we just presume this to be the, the exemplary form of a family, okay? And, and Simmer's, Simmel's talking about uh, this secrecy and, and social bonds and stuff in the modern context. So we have three people here. Um, what are some of its properties? suddenly. Well, I wouldn't say it's quite as fragile. If you have three or more, suddenly it's more secure. Why? Well, just think, um, just keep it fairly simple. Let's suppose that one person leaves. Maybe um, it could be anybody. It could even be the child when they reach a certain age. Who knows? But one person leaves. 
this one here leaves. Okay, you just, now you have still a family here, or maybe two families here, right? So the family as a social bond can still exist if one person leaves. So the social group under the name family still presumes an existence. One person can leave. Um, so it's more secure for that reason as a, let's use a big fancy philosophical term, as an ontological category, family is more secure and more long lasting for this reason. Uh, when you have a dyadic social bond, one person leaves, you can't say there's a marriage anymore because you're by yourself, right? But in a triadic family, in a triadic structure with a, that we're calling in our example family, one person can leave, you can still have something that you call a family or a social group, it's still possible. Indeed, you could have two, you could have three, you, it, you know, it, things get more complicated here, and that's the point, but also more secure, the social bond is more guaranteed. Uh, according to this theory anyway, in the modern context, because one person can leave the group. Indeed, the larger the group, the more secure ontologically that social group is. Think about a business like McDonald's. You're fed up working at McDonald's, Starbucks, whatever, and you quit your job. That's, it does nothing to McDonald's. It will still exist as a social group, as a business in this case. It can exist easily without you, it's so large. Right, but maybe a small family business. I used to sell donuts at a market um, many, many years ago when I was an undergraduate student. And if I would have quit, it would have destroyed the whole business until they could find a replacement. That's how fragile the social bond was. It was smaller and so on. So you know, the child can run away from home and the family is still there. Uh, the couple can divorce and the family is still there. Nobody would claim that there's no family. Um, sometimes we'll say it kind of offhandedly because we had a certain notion of family in our mind, but as an ontological principle of a social bond, it still exists. Each can pair with the child. The family can persist in some sense. Um, second, it's more, it's, um, it's less volatile. I mean, you can already intuit this from what I've been saying. Well, because there's some distance between people. What is the distance? Well, the distance uh, between, let's say, this person and this person might have to pass through this person. So this person, the third person up here, is something of an obstacle to the, to the dyadic relationship between these two people, right? So the point is, to keep it simple, there's more distance in a triadic social bond or in social groups that have more than three members. Because there's more distance, it's more secure. Distance is something like a guarantee. Incidentally, distance is the place of secrecy. So uh, with distance, finally, comes the fact that, um, I'm going to write the word distance because it's so important here. So put it simply, in a dyadic social bond, there's basically no distance or hardly any. In a triadic social bond, you finally have the ingredient of distance. And distance is the security and the removal of the volatility of the social bond to some extent in the modern period. Um, so with distance comes inevitably the fact that you don't know everything about the other person. It's very important. It, it can become a problem in of itself, you know, in a, mo in a modern society, a complex society with more people, larger complex social bonds, um, we're not concerned anymore with knowing everything about a person. We're concerned precisely with the fact that we don't want to know everything about a person. You're telling me too much about your personal life or whatever. This is what bothers us. Now, in a dyadic social bond, we want to hear the too muchness, perhaps. But in a, in a three or more person social bond, suddenly you have to be selective about what you tell the other person. Right? We, we don't want to know everything. We just want to know what's important. So we might say something, for example, like, why would you tell me that? I don't need to know that. Or if they didn't tell you something that you should have known, you'll say, that's something you should have told me. Right? It's a little different. It's, it's about being selective or pragmatic with what you tell. Suddenly it becomes about knowing what's, what you should keep as a secret because it's necessary for the social bond. Let's say you, you, you're in a giant crowd in, the, in metropolis, downtown Toronto, 
and you, you bump into people everywhere. You don't want to tell them everything. You only want to tell them what's important, right? It, so, so secrecy, and this is the point, secrecy uh, becomes constitutive of the social bond or social group. It's a constitutive element of the social group in a comp modern complex uh, social bond of three or more. Uh, so secrecy, it's, it's not that secrets occur because of some sort of terrible motive on the part of people like, oh, I'm not going to tell that person that because I want to win something over. It's not like that. It's, it's a fact of the social bond. You can't live without secrecy in a, in a complex modern social bond. It's the fact of the social group. In a sense, you could even say, and this is kind of what George Simmel is trying to teach us, you must have secrets and secrets are the cornerstone of having a functioning modern complex social bond. It's not like you can do without them. It's like the essential ingredient of a social bond. Um, so larger complex society necessitates secrecy. That's the important point. And why, again, to repeat, simply because um, you have so many interactions with so many different people in a modern urban uh, society that you have to be selective about what information you tell uh, other people. Uh, indeed, you're, you're, you're expected not to reveal needless information to other people, but only to focus on what they should know, right? So if you're in a, like, for example, in the modern dating scene, uh, sorry, the contemporary dating scene, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're perhaps dating a lot of people and perhaps you have children. I knew this from personal experience. You're, you're expected to tell the person right away up front that you have a child. Like you don't want to, you don't hide it and then tell them later. Uh, some people are very upset by that. So it's about no, but you also don't want to tell them, hey, um, I, I, I just bought a car or, you know, hey, my mom um, has these cool new shoes or something. You know, you, you don't want to say everything. But if you were in a dyadic relationship, perhaps you would say more of this sort of stuff that doesn't seem important. OK. Um, so the group of three or more has these new characteristics in the modern context. Two people can bond with one another. Uh, against the third person. You can have an allyship and a rivalry. The third can be used as an intermediary between an argument that's occurring between the other two to solve a conflict between the other two. You know, George Simmel even suggests that this is the origin of the modern notion of the state, the government, um, precisely to, to intervene as an impartial uh, ar uh, impartial observer of the ongoings of the citizens. Two people can bond through a secret about the third. This can happen in a triadic bond, it doesn't happen in a dyadic bond. Um, by the way, this is a real bonding practice that I know really well because um, I was married once and uh, I'm giving a personal example, maybe it's too much information. Um, but I was in a marriage and uh, she was something of a stepmother to my child. And I knew it was kind of awkward for them to bond. So they used to, I pretended I didn't know, they used to bond over making fun of me. <laughs> they called me Dr. Forehead. Mm. I <laughs> but, you know, I didn't stop it and I didn't feel like I was upset because I knew that this was a bonding practice. It worked for them. Uh, so this, this is how things can work. And it's also, I mean, just think of the courtroom. You have a defendant, you have a prosecutor or something like that. I don't know what they're called. And you have a judge. Well, the dyadic bond between the defendant and the prosecutor, they're emotionally invested in this. So there's a third person who's in the room, but not of the situation, who can sort of listen and, and say, okay, I'm impartial. I judge that this is what's going on. This is why you need three in that situation. Um, so the third person in this sense is what Symbol would call a strange person, an eccentric person. They're sort of in the group, but not of the group. 
Okay, so what finally is a secret society for symbol? Well, basically all societies, all modern societies are secret societies. So don't think of, you know, the Freemasons or the Illuminati or uh, whatever else. All, secrecy is constitutive to modern society. It's uh, it, incidentally in a secret society, it's not the content of a secret that matters. Like, are you putting your thumb on the right knuckle or um, are you doing the right gestures and stuff like this? You know, it's, it's, it's not about that. It's about the fact of the secret as forming a social bond with others. At a, in a formal level, Simmel was a formal sociologist, a bit like Marshall McLuhan. It's not about what's said in the secret, the content of the secret. It's about the fact of the secret itself as let's say something like a media object. It, it, it forms our social bonds in space and time. You can't do without a secret. It is a fact of modernity. So it's not about the content of the message of the secret that matters. Um, what matters is the fact of a secret. You share the formal properties of the secret, secrecy as the actual um, basis of a social bond. Um, that's all I wanted to say about George Simmel for now. Again, remember, this is a modern problem, a modern question, a modern orientation, modern context. Let's move forward now into the work of Jean-Francois Lyotard, French um, philosopher, really, um, although it's questionable if he's a philosopher, it's hard to say. Lyotard was the inventor of basically the theory and phrase and idea of postmodernism. Okay, he didn't say we post postmodernism is something you choose. Like, I'm going to be a postmodern thinker. Ah, oh, it doesn't work like that. He's saying postmodernism is the environment. It is the ideology in a sense. He didn't call it ideology. Um, one of his students, Frederick Jameson, called it ideology. And, and Jameson wrote the preface to Leotard's book on postmodernism. But it's basically like we're all postmodern, whether we like it or not. You know, like when certain, when a certain Canadian scholar, for example, goes around calling other people postmodern Marxists, he's missing the point. We're all postmodern. The question is, do you recognize the way in which you are implicated in the postmodern environment, the way in which it determines your speech, your ideas, your thinking, your way of relating to other people and so on? This is the fundamental point, right? So Leotard invented this, uh, this notion of postmodernism roughly in the late 1970s. Um, we can't do justice again to, to his work given time constraints, so I need to be extremely selective about what I share about his work. Basically, his writing was a, a report to the Quebec government in Canada on this, I'm quoting the subtitle of the book, The Status of Knowledge in um, Highly Advanced Technological um, Societies. In other words, in societies that have gone very far beyond a certain threshold uh, in the modern orientation, you know, you know, modernity is described as uh, secularism, urbanization, technological advancements, and so on. Postmodernity is also defined as that. You know, the only difference is we've reached a threshold. It's very complicated, and I'm not going to get into it, but I mean, Leotard even said postmodernism is modernism in its nascent state, which means that it's like what's most modern about modernism. There's even claims that Socrates was postmodern and everything. We're not, we're just going to put that to the side. This is the problem of developing it as a naive sort of historical thing. Like we have the modern context and the postmodern context. Well, but let, let's just put that to the side and say we have moved from a modern sensibility or orientation to a postmodern. Um, and he's looking at how societies have gone very far in the direction of uh, modern modernization. Um, it should be mentioned that Lyotard didn't quite like this essay on postmodernism. I think he may have even said it was his worst, the worst thing he's ever written. Uh, but nonetheless, he wrote it. We have it now. It was funded by the Quebec government. Um, and it's become a cornerstone of, of uh, anything postmodern. You must engage with Lyotard's work if you're using the word postmodern. If you're not engaging with Lyotard's work, something's missing there. 
So when you hear certain people talk about postmodernism without ever mentioning Leotard, you should, you should ask them to what extent they have an understanding of, of what, what, what people mean when they say postmodern. For instance, have you ever heard anybody ever claim themselves to be postmodern? Very rarely. It's like, it's like the, the boogeyman. Everybody claims it exists, but nobody can point at it. <laughs> you know, it's very, it's very strange. Um, so it's a strange accusation because we don't yet know what postmodern really means. Well, Leotard put it like this. I'm going to quote him because it's the most popular quote of what it means to be postmodern. He basically says it's a context, it's a sensibility, it's a way of orienting us, whether we're aware of it or not. He says, simplifying to the extreme, I define postmodern as an incredulity toward meta narratives. Okay, we have some words in here. Maybe some of you are wondering what they mean. You might already be starting to Google them. Incredulity. That means suspicion, distrust. You distrust or you're suspicious of something, or you basically just don't believe something. You don't have a belief in something. Toward meta narratives. What is a meta narrative? Okay, a meta narrative otherwise referred to sometimes in sociology as a grand narrative or even a grand theory. In sociology, we sometimes use these words instead of meta narrative. They mean basically the same idea. It's a master idea. It's a big idea, a big explanation that holds together all of your truth claims. In other words, it's our single or singular explanation for a given historical event, uh, experience, and so on. A meta narrative is a way to authorize or legitimize truth. It's a standard by which you assess something to be truthful or not. So something can be considered truthful by virtue of it being reducible to an a priori, which means coming before or already established, universal standard of truth. So really, the important point here is that a meta narrative is a universal explanation, a single universal explanation or justification for something being considered a truth or a fact, if you like. We are within the domain of what in philosophy is called epistemology. Spelled like this. Epistemology is the study of judgments concerning truth, the way in which you judge something to be a truth or a fact or whatever, a truth claim. So you make a claim to a truth um, on what basis, right? So a meta narrative could be, I'm going to give you some examples because all of what I've just said, I understand is quite obscure. So let me give you some concrete examples. A meta narrative could be religion. A religion is for Leotard, a meta narrative, right? And we know in the modern period, we get more and more secular. So of course, we're going to be more and more against universal belief systems like a religion, meta narrative. Uh, anything that happens, perhaps, you can simply appeal to the divine wisdom of scripture. It provides all the answers you wanted. So let's say you don't believe something to be true or you believe something to be true. You justify it by saying, well, it says in this holy book, whichever it is, this, and that's why it's true. That's a meta narrative. In postmodernism, we're very suspicious of meta narratives. Not everybody. I mean, there's real limitations to this theory, believe me. Um, so it could be a, a religion. It could be science. Science at one time, I don't think it is anymore by any stretch of the imagination, but science at one time could be a universal epistemology. You know, if something's a fact, well, hold it up to the scientific method <laughs> um, to see if it is as your justification. You need evidence, scientific evidence, which means empirical evidence and so on. Um, Marxism for Leotard, was a meta narrative. So, you know, anything could be reduced to ideology, ideology. Anything could be reduced to uh, class struggle, your class position. So, it could be a meta narrative. Uh, so, we have religion, science, Marxism, and, and perhaps there's many other forms of meta narratives. The point 
is not that Lyotard is critiquing meta narratives. That's not the point. He's not out to critique meta narratives necessarily. He's really just noticing that that's what we're all doing in the latest moment of history, in the latest context, in the postmodern context. We are all suspicious of meta narratives, of universal positions on truth, you know, super theories of super everything, something like that. Um, so in this latest context, we're, we're very suspicious of that. In the modern context, we're only becoming suspicious of that. Postmodern accounts of truth seem to favor pragmatic notions of truth, situational notions of truth, localized notions of truth, tribal notions of truth, all justified not by universal theories or systems or beliefs, but much rather localized and particular truths, like the truth of my group or the truth of, um, of my region of the world or the you know, the truth of my particular religion, like, whereas the old universal religions, religious metanaires would be like, everything in the world should be understood by this text. Now, many religious scholars will say, well, I assess everything in the world according to this particular scripture, and I understand that you assess it according to your particular scripture. So it's not a universal measure anymore. Religions are more particular and you recognize that they're situational and context specific and, and so on. So the best way to phrase this, I guess, is, to summarize this is we've moved from grand statements about the entire everything towards sort of like, well, that's your point of view and this is my point of view. Or we'll say things like, I don't wanna deny your truth, but this is my truth. Um, or that's your opinion and this is my opinion, my educated opinion and that's your educated opinion, for example. We recognize that truth is contested and that it's localized and other people have particular vantage points other, that are opposed to ours. And we even accommodate that more in the postmodern age. So there's a movement ultimately here from within the modern context from something like, how can I do this? Um, From um, universal declarations toward particular declarations or what we sometimes call relativism. Uh, so postmodernism is something like a relativist doctrine, which comes in different forms. There's different types of relativism. Don't be fooled. It's not just like there's one type of relativism. There's, there's what's called subjectivism and, and you know, there's all kinds of different, uh, there's perspectivism and, and so on. So, um, so postmodernism, though, is not a universal doctrine like we had in the more modern period. We have a particular or a relativist doctrine. So what happens in the context of postmodernism, finally? Well, in the context of postmodernism, when we have a relativist doctrine, the universal sort of meta narratives have collapsed. We're suspicious of them. We just don't buy into them anymore. We don't believe them. Secrecy changes. This is the point. The complex social bond of three or more is not bound together on the basis of a shared formal secret anymore. A new form of secrecy has emerged that's not tied to universal standards of evaluation, to universal metrics, but toward particular affirmations of truth, relativist notions of truth. A secret is something you do not have, you know, in the modern context, the secret is something you're deprived of, something uh, in the modern context that you don't, you just don't know. It's being withheld from you. You wish you knew, but you don't know. Perhaps you have a desire to know. That's what a secret is in the modern period. But in the postmodern period, we seem to have something more like gossip and rumors. And that's not what you don't know. It's actually something you do kind of know. It's not something you wish you knew that you're being deprived of. Something different's going on here. This is why I wanna to turn to conclude for today. I wanna to turn to the work of Vladin Dolaire. 
a, a, a very contemporary scholar. I mean, the, the video I posted on Blackboard is from 2019, I think the later part of 2019. So it's fresh, it's fairly new. Um, he gave it in Switzerland and it's a, it's a philosophical lecture on rumors and gossip that's very high level. So, you know, if you don't understand it, that's perfectly okay. Just try and try and work through it. And, um, you know, you can even skip through that video, just focus on the lecture video where I'll highlight what's most important. Um, and, and this is where I'm going to conclude with an elaboration of this new postmodern context of secrecy in the form of gossip and rumors which is again, to be very specific in the modern context, a secret was something you were deprived of that formed the basis of a social bond and that you wanted to know. Uh, gossip and rumors are something different. Uh, Miladin Dolaire, I hope you remember, he's a part of the Slovenian school or orientation um, alongside Slavo Žižic and Alenka Suponsic. Uh, he's not our exemplary figure of that school. He's more peripheral. Slavoj is our central or exemplary figure. In any case, Dolaire begins, by begins in his lecture by arguing that rumors and gossip are important subject matter for thinking. It's important that we, that we engage with topics of gossip and rumors, although it seems like something that has nothing to do with, with um, academia, with our work here, with thinking. What he does is he, he begins by creating a, a few concepts, a few definitions, beginning with opinion. What is an opinion or what in antiquity they called doxa, but we're just gonna call it opinion. What is an opinion? Well, an opinion for Dolaire, he says it's basically tautological. Tautological means um, I would imagine it like this. It's self-referential. Like it, it's circular, it's a circular argument in a sense, but it's tautological just basically means that it's self-justified. An opinion justifies itself precisely by repeating itself as its own justification. So for example, you'll say like, I think that this is true because I think it is true, it is therefore true. Like, I think it's true, therefore it is true. That's tautological. You're saying it's true simply because you think it's true. That's an opinion for, uh, according to Dolaire, Maladin Dolaire. It's because I think it's true that it is true. That's your claim to the truth. That's your truth claim. Okay, well, in academia, we typically want to avoid opinion. We don't like tautological um, forms of arguments. We don't like that type of logic that's self-referential, self-justified, and so on. We just want, we typically, what we want to do is we want to focus on facts, on truth in this sense. And we don't, we don't think opinion is truth or a fact, typically. Um, on the other hand, we have what Dolaire calls episteme, or epistemes in the plural, doesn't matter um, if you want to pluralize it or keep it singular. An episteme is not um, tautological. An episteme is something that must be um, grounded in something. It must be justified somehow by some measure outside of itself, which means that it's not simply saying it is true because it is true. You say it is true because of this other reason. So it's grounded by something other, right? So for example, in the modern period, according to Lyotard, a truth was justified, its episteme was through some sort of universal meta narrative. That was an episteme, a universal meta narrative. Like religion is an episteme, science is an episteme, Marxism is an episteme, and we can think of many others. So that was its epistemological justification. It was a knowledge or a truth that's justified by some universal theory like religion, Marxism, a political doctrine or science or whatever else. It's, it's justified, it's, it's not tautological, it's justified by something other than itself. So the belief is that knowledge must have some type of grounding in something other, evidence or based on objectivity or neutrality and so on. Well, in the modern period, 
We can talk about a modern episteme. We can talk about a modern episteme. How does it achieve, how does one achieve objectivity in the modern period? Well, we said through, through um, a universal uh, meta narrative or Leotard or Simmel through uh, distance, which I told you about earlier, right? Like, by being at a distance from the group, like a judge, a judge being at a distance from the group uh, of two people that are arguing and accusing one another of something, he gets some object, he or she or they get some objectivity. Let's say two people are arguing in a cafe and you've overheard uh, their whole exchange. You can say, hey, I, I'm impartial. I can give you my point of view. And it can be somewhat relied upon because it's outside. It's, it's, it's an out external sort of justification that grounds it. Right? So in the modern period, it's distance for symbol. For Leotard, it's a universal meta narrative. These are modern epistemes. Uh, okay, but that's the modern period. What about, finally, what we've been calling uh, the postmodern period? Postmodern episteme. Is there a postmodern episteme? Sorry about the yellow. I realize that's not easy to see. Uh, we no longer believe in that objectivity, a universal meta narrative, or distance is really. Uh, possible. It's not that we don't believe it. It's not there. You know, the social group has, has, has changed in some sense. There's no position from which we seem to be capable of grasping truth in the old modern epistemic sense. Um, we even talk about how everything's socially constructed today in sociology, for example. It's like, you know, in even claiming about social construction, we're denying the fact of objectivity. Right? We're saying everybody's biased and so on. So this is, this is a consequence of the shift from the modern to the uh, postmodern episteme. So an episteme has something to do with an authorization for truth or knowledge. It authorizes its factual status. Right? This is what Dallaire is even claiming. So, okay, so, so far for Dallaire, we have two, two concepts, opinion and episteme. Now we add rumor. Or rumors. What is a rumor? Now, things are much more deep than what I'm presenting you here, um, but and I wish I could I could really get into the nuts and bolts of this because I really enjoy this this theory very much. A rumor is kind of lower on the hierarchy than an opinion. So let's say if we were to rank these, I should maybe do it a little different. I, I should arrange it a little different. If we were to rank these in terms of how we tend to uh, see things as being more or less truthful. We would say that an episteme is like the highest, an opinion next, and then rumor. Um, with an opinion, what's interesting is that we do believe our opinions to be true. That's why it's tautological. We'll say like, it's true because I say it's true. So you have a belief in a truth there with an opinion. You can actually subscribe to your point of view or your opinion. Right? So with an opinion, we nonetheless believe them to be true. We subscribe to an opinion. But with a rumor, what's interesting, so let me just put that there is a belief here in an opinion. With a rumor, um, there's no need to believe them to be true. They'll still function, whether or not you believe them to be true. That's what's fascinating about a rumor from a philosophical standpoint. With a rumor, I'm quoting Dolaire, nobody subscribes 
to them. Nobody subscribes to the truth, to the truthfulness of a rumor. So for example, we'll hear things like, um, how do people say it? Like, um, people, you'll hear people say like, people claim that X is whatever. It's a rumor. You'll, you'll whisper it perhaps. People claim that, that Dwayne, blah, blah, blah. Um, what's interesting about a rumor is there's no clear author of a rumor, author being the root word for authority. There's no clear author in an authority. With an opinion, you, you know who has the opinion. With a rumor, you don't know who necessarily started the rumor. Uh, there's no clear author. It seems to circulate anonymously impersonally without it, without anybody actually fixating themselves to it as an as an object of belief um they're sort of impartial about it they'll say it's almost like you're saying it out of the side of your mouth like i heard that this is true you're not saying it is true you're saying i heard it was somebody said to me that it's true that Dwayne blah 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 that's a rumor um it's impersonal it comes from nowhere it moves around it circulates um, like a like a whirlwind, nobody claims it as being truthful for themselves, but they nobody necessarily subscribes to it. But it nonetheless works. It's like air. It's like it's like a breeze or a wind. It flows around. Nobody knows who the people are that claimed it to be true, but you know that it, that somebody claimed it to be true. It's totally anonymous. You're just hearing that it could be true. The whole function of a rumor is simply to continue to circulate to continue to move from one person to another, from one Twitter feed to another and so on. The whole function is for it to just keep blowing around. It's a lot of air. Um, however, there's one crucial point. What is the place, and this is the very important question, what is the place of authority in a room? Is it a meta narrative? It's not clear that it's a meta narrative. It's not a meta narrative, but it still has authority. Um, with an episteme, authority is a principle of uh, justified by a meta narrative within a modern episteme. In a postmodern episteme, you have authority, but without the meta narrative. Like there's real consequences to rumors and gossip. With opinions, authority is self-authorized. The truth is authorized through tautology, through self-reference. With rumors, there is authority, but there's no author. There's no principle that holds it together. There's no meta narratives. It's also not self-referential. It's a different beast. Um, it's something else altogether. And that's why rumors are so damaging and so dangerous. What is so dangerous is that it's precisely because, according to Maladin Dolaire, it's precisely because rumors are impersonal and anonymous, unlike an opinion. It's because rumors are impersonal and anonymous that they have even more authority. There's no proof, there's no origin, there's no author, there's no evidence, there's no guarantee that it's true, like it was in the modern episteme. But its impact and its consequence as a truth is nonetheless felt all the more violently and with even more certainty than what we had in the modern episteme. You know, at least in the modern episteme of, let's say, Christian scripture, you, there was doubt. Within science, there was a notion of doubt. You know, you would have falsification, you would falsify a, hy a hypothesis. Um, but in the postmodern period, you have no meta narrative, but everybody's certain of the rumor. There's a certainty. That's the violence. It's just a pure force, like a tornado. That's, it's actually impossible to combat because of this. It's easy to combat an opinion. It's easy to combat a modern episteme that has a meta narrative. You simply say, well, you, you know, your whole authority comes out of a book or comes out of, a, comes out of uh, your naive sort of belief in a certain scientific principle or whatever else, or you're, you're an ideologue of Marxism or something. But with a rumor, you can't even combat it. There's no way to combat it, to fight back against it. It's just a pure force. And so what you hear is that everybody knows that it's true, that it's a rumor, but nobody perhaps claims responsibility for it. And so it works. 
It's a form of belief. Without a believer. The opinion, you have a believer there. The modern episteme, you have a believer. Here, you don't have a believer. Nobody claims to believe that it's true, and yet it functions. I give the example from the uh, from Zizek and from the Slovenian school of what they call the Tibetan prayer wheel. You know, the way it works is that you can put it out in the field and the wind will blow it. It will pray for you. You don't need to pray. In the same way, um, there's the old joke of the horseshoe. Somebody puts a horseshoe, a scientist, I think, I'm going to butcher the joke. The scientist puts a horseshoe above his door. And a guy comes in and says, I thought you were a scientist. You don't believe that horseshoes actually give you good luck. And he says, no, no, I don't believe that. But I heard it works even if you don't believe it. This is the point. The, the point is that the, you don't need to believe. The belief is constituted without there being a believer. Almost in the very practice of the rumor, the belief is constituted. So, um, so um, I'm, I'm just going to jump to the end here. And there's, there's so much more I can say. But the point is that rumors um, can be elevated to something like a gossip or a truth, where, um, where people actually will explicitly claim them to be true in the public domain and not simply through whispers, and they get elevated as a philosophy or as a science or as a truth. This is the temptation, according to Dallaire. The temptation is to elevate a rumor to the status of a truth, to rationalize and legitimize rumors. And when you do this, it becomes what he calls gossip. When you go beyond the rumor and you make it into a fact um, that, that is publicly declared, like perhaps somebody gets fired because of a rumor, right? Um, then it becomes elevated to the status of a truth. It's gossip. That's the danger. Or you could also call it wisdom. It's another word. It becomes a wisdom. Like we don't have any evidence or truth, but nonetheless, we shouldn't do this. It's a wisdom. It's like there's a moral implication here. Um, so it's, this is the real danger. Social movements can develop out of rumors. Th this is what Maladin Dolaire is against. And he's a Marxist, let's be clear. Uh, his claim is that in, let's say, the postmodern period, rumors and gossip carry the day. Why? because the old modern epistemes have fallen, and this is the new episteme. This is the postmodern context. Um, I'll stop here. <laughs>